This is the 11th annual walking tour, and I'm sorry that we're not all together. We're gonna to do the best we can today, and I'm joined by a guy who is a true community leader in the Bronx, also a resident of the Bronx, and I dare say graduate of Manhattan College, Michael Brady. Welcome, and you know, one day we will be back with you. Uh, celebrating and toasting uh, our communities and our small businesses and our friends around the world. But for today, uh, we welcome you to the South Bronx for, for a little tour of Mott Haven and Port Morris. And what I've tried to do over the last 10 years is to show neighborhoods that would have a impact. And we're gonna do that today. We, we are gonna focus in the Bronx, uh, particularly the South Bronx, in a neighborhood that has seen many changes and more changes on the way. And what we will see uh, today is a remarkable turnaround and where there is still much more to do, but there is an energy and a powerful energy. To be respectful to everybody, I'm putting up this mask. Michael's gonna do the same thing, and we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna chat about uh, this particular part of the South Bronx. These are great masks, by the way. That's a great organization called BronxNet that uh, does a lot of good work with young people, and uh, they are helping us film this uh, as, as we try to offer a digital experience of, of what's happening here in the South Bronx. We built a media network for you. BronxNet TV. Come learn in your new state-of-the-art studios at Lehman College, at Mercy College, and the South Bronx in the Hub. Inspire with your stories, culture, history. Your Bronx on BronxNet. Engage with us. Connect with us at your channels and at BronxNet.tv. Learn. Engage. Inspire. BronxNet TV. From the Bronx to the world. <laughs> BronxNet. <laughs> Thanks to our friends at BronxNet, uh, Bronx Strong. So Michael, if, if we could talk about uh, the Bruckner and Bruckner Boulevard and Mott Haven, and if you could give people a, just a quick description of, of uh, Mott Haven and the Bronx. The area that we're gonna go to today, uh, Mott Haven and Port Morris, have roots back to Irish immigration. Uh, Jordan Mott and the Mott Haven Iron, Iron Works. I, I was waiting for you to tie the Irish back. See, well, you know, you, you yeah. can't, go, can't go far without a good Irishman around. Uh, but Jordan Mott founded uh, the Mott Iron Works, and he employed so many first-generation Irish immigrants that be it became Mott's Haven. Uh, and that's how we got our, our neighborhood name, Mott Haven. Sure. What, what was it? What was manufactured in Mott Haven? You had everything from ironworks. Uh, the this, this steel that was used on the Capitol Dome was forged out of Mott Haven. Uh, you had a lot of industry. Piano factories are kind of uh, the, the iconic image that people have of this strip of Bruckner Boulevard, whether it's Steinway pianos to the Etsy piano factory. All of those were you know, critical to the manufacturing and industrial development that we saw in that area. When I come through the Bruckner Boulevard, it is a place that has a lot of character. And um, what I am seeing as we go through the neighborhood is a creative, readaptive use of a lot of these older buildings. Starting with the clock tower. The clock tower, uh, which, what was it, old piano factory? Absolutely, it was the uh, SD piano factory. And now it's a mixed use building. The clock tower is, I, I think, one of the most photographed buildings in the Mott Haven section of the South Bronx. And it's because of its, its rich history in terms of job production, but it's also, you know, talking about its, its present day use. It was the first building that was under an MX rezoning. They decided to rezone one block the block from Lincoln Avenue to Alexander Avenue as a way of making sure that this old, very large piano factory had a purpose in the community. And that's when you started to see the residential conversion. And then about 10 years ago or so, you started to see the, the pop-up of some, some of the, the storefronts. So you've got roughly in, in the original clock tower, you have about 120 units of, of residential. And then, you know, as a result of having you know, more development and more of a demand for housing in the neighborhood, Carnegie Management Corporation, the owner of the building, they actually built out two very large extensions. 
And I think that's an important message is the readaptive use of an old factory building into residential in a core that anchored the neighborhood. Particularly in these uh, largely industrial areas where you didn't have a tremendous amount of uh, residential population, it's incumbent upon us as, as urban planners and, and practitioners to really think about how do we reuse those uh, warehouses, those piano factories for a common good, whether it's housing, whether it's office, whether it's ground floor retail, all of those I think are things that we have to really think down and drill down and address in, in a way that is good for the neighborhood in terms of neighborhood stabilization, good for the economic development, but also really good for the residents. It provides jobs, it provides a much needed neighborhood amenity in terms of having a place to eat. And when we look at areas like parts of the South Bronx, which were food deserts, who didn't have access to, to res restaurants for a very long period of time, you know, these are the types of injections that our local economies need. So you're, you're taking readaptive uh, old factory buildings, the factories ain't coming back. Right. You're adding new housing to supplement that. Where are these kids gonna go to school? That's you know, a really good question, and one that the South Bronx struggled with for a really long time. And you know, luckily, we've found some pretty creative ways forward. 50 Bruckner, which was uh, known as the Ice House, it's uh, on Bruckner Boulevard, and for the longest time in its history, it was used for the ice of the Bronx. You'd have these enormous bricks of ice go into this warehouse, and they'd be chipped up and sent all over the borough to provide cooling. You know, some enterprising real estate folks came in and initially they just wanted to restore the historic building. But then they really listened to the community need and the community said, you know, we have a lot of people moving in here. We were already short on schools. We need a path forward to fix this. So the property owner entered into an agreement with uh, Dream Academy and they're moving in there this fall. Different grades. Right? So you're gonna have uh, pre-K through eighth grade here. Ground floor. Ground floor retail. So you're gonna have two of these allocated for the entrance to the school. It's also gonna add about 200 teachers to the neighborhood. And teachers are consumers, whether it's bodegas, stick of gum, or happy hour. And it's interesting when you get to Alexander Avenue. How, how would you describe Alexander Avenue? Alexander Avenue is a really eclectic mix of ground floor retail, tenement housing, and it just has such energy about it. And I think the energy is there because it's grounded in community residents having ownership in their small businesses on there. It's not you know, a big conglomerate didn't come in and put a Foot Locker or a Macy's. These are small little shops that the, the business owner is in the shop working. And it builds this, this, this neighborhood sense of stability and ownership. I would be envious in a lot of other neighborhoods given the variety of different shops, the creativity of the different shops, Let's walk through some of them. Uh, you know, there's a place called Cite's. Every time I go by there with you, I get hungry. You want to take a look inside? Cite uh, opened about seven years ago. It's owned by uh, Amir Shine. He's an Israeli immigrant. COVID-19 has hit this neighborhood like every other neighborhood in New York City. What has he done to stay, stay alive? He did something very creative. He, he ripped out his, his sushi bar, flanked it at the front door, and now he has only a sushi bar. And the place is bustling. Bustling. He's, he has said that he's done more business in COVID-19 since he's made that change than he has before. What's the favorite dish? What, what, what's the most popular dish here? What is it? The Kawasaki roll. Kawasaki roll. And the tuna bruschetta. Oh, amazing. This looks perfect. Wow. wow. Look at this. Wow. 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 This is great. And this is the Kawasaki roll. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Kawasaki roll. That's oven baked crab inside with mayo steam sauce. It's fully covered with uh, avocado. This is just the warm up. I think this is just to give them a, a tease. Yeah. Well, with that said, after I've eaten, I've drinking, I'm going to take a walk down. So we keep walking and we, we run into the Bronx's only independent bookstore right next to CTA. The Lip Bar is actually the Bronx's only bookstore. We're doing a little conference tour. So, you know, we're trying to highlight our local folks. I love to hear it. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Noelle Santos is one of the most driven people that I, I know. She's, she's smart, she's from the neighborhood, and she saw a huge gap. You know, 
literacy gap in the borough. And she said, well, I'm gonna try to fix it. And she developed a really extensive business plan, won an award from Citibank for her business plan. You know, she's, she's been written up in Forbes, et cetera, because she filled the borough gap of providing books to our community. This is a, another person fully engaged in the neighborhood. Absolutely. And you go up the block recruiting a new chocolate factory and cafe. On Alexander Avenue, there are a lot of buildings that were formerly burnt out lots. And we've seen some infill development there. Uh, the last infill development on the corner of Alexander and 134th Street has had two ground floor vacant retail spaces. And they're going to be the, the future home of Choco Bar Cortez, the largest producer of, of chocolate in the Caribbean, is opening a retail shop on, on Alexander Avenue. And then they're using the other storefront for uh, chocolate production, so light manufacturing. So not only is it gonna be a job producer, but it's also gonna be a retail. I was born and raised here in the South Bronx, and my whole life I heard negative things about my home, my borough, my people, but I believe that the Bronx is the most beautiful place on Earth, so that's why we created this brand to change the narrative. What do you sell? We sell Bronx-based merchandise. How long have you been at it? Uh, we're about to hit three years now in October. You live in the neighborhood? I live, uh, but yeah, by the uh, Lincoln uh, <laughs> Hospital over there. Can I see your shop? Yeah, yeah, come in, come in. What's your yeah. biggest seller here? My biggest seller, uh, we have a shirt that says El Bronx. Can I get it? Yeah! yeah. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if people are feeling this walking tour, but I am. You've created a new business lab. You have the restaurants engaged. You're, you're bringing in a chocolate factory. The school will be opened up in the next six months. What keeps Michael Brady ticking? The energy of the people. I mean, we saw, we're walking down the street. There are hugs, there are hellos, there are how's your business. And more importantly, during the COVID-19, crisis. What can I do? People down there are not looking for a handout. You know, folks want to help however they can. When it comes to the South Bronx, it is what I have seen extraordinary steps. Going out on the street, seeing what you've done during this pandemic, bringing a dozen restaurants together and feeding nearly a million people. Haven became official in 2013. I, I have to ask the, the, the stuff that you're doing to feed uh, people on the front line. This is not your normal operation. Oh, no, no, this no, is no, not no. the normal setup, this, right? I have the setup there, but the thing is, I usually lay out all the plates. So tomorrow I start off with uh, 260 in the morning, and then we we'll move into another 100. 260 meals that you'll provide. About a week, we're doing 3,000. 3,000 meals. A million people have been fed through their oh, yeah. efforts. I was close for two weeks. Oh, I got a call from uh, Dr. Eddie Summers. Okay. He reached out to me. He said, I think I, I could, you know, plug you in. Okay. We're doing something now with Royal Central Kitchen. And at that moment, they were only working with nope. Bistro. I bought food. I bought a plate. I did my little research. I did a presentation at other restaurants. And I started cooking. That's, that's incredible. I, I, I was here about a week ago, and I saw medical staff walking out of this place with great big smiles. We take really good care of our customers. Yeah. Sometimes they even just stop by and they're like, when are you guys opening? Is this delivery back here? Uh, no, we gave out food on Saturday with uh, Frontline Foods. So from us in the South Bronx, we Cheers. salute you. Cheers. <laughs>